Uh, be prepared for a great panel on law and policy. Actually, this is the law and policy panel, but the papers seem to be sort of understanding that boundary between the technology and how humans deal with it, whether it's the, the social for dishonest anthropomorphism or how we think about explanations um, or the sociological meaning of racial categories or um, sort of the, the interactions, the causal interactions that cause certain types of categories to enter the machine models. They're all at that boundary between the real world and the, the essentially completed machine. Um, this for great different perspectives, and let's just hear them. Good afternoon, as I seize with enthusiasm the envied spot of kicking off the last session before happy hour. <laughs> On the upside, there's no math and there's lots of robots, so maybe a little bit of a break. I didn't beat everybody to blockchain today, but I think I'm the first one to talk seriously about robots, so points for that. I'm Brenda Leong, I'm the Senior Policy Council and Director of Strategy at the Future of Privacy Forum, which is a privacy think tank in DC, and I wrote this paper with Evan Selinger, who is a professor of philosophy at Rochester Institute of Technology. And being here all day in a room mostly full of computer scientists, I suddenly understand how all the non-lawyers feel when my colleagues and I start talking law. You can follow the discussion, but it's really easy to miss the nuances and even easier to say something that makes it clear you're not really in the club. So please listen gently. The goal of our paper is to advance the design, policy, and ethics scholarship on how engineers and regulators can protect consumers from deceptive robots and artificial intelligence systems that exhibit the problem of dishonest anthropomorphism. I want to start up front with an acknowledgement that everything we are talking about in this paper is building on ideas surrounding the principle of honest anthropomorphism, which was originally formulated by Margot Kaminsky, Matthew Rubin, William Smart, and Cindy Grimm in their 2017 Maryland Law Review article called Averting Robot Eyes, where they propose the need for additions to the FIPS, the Fair Information Practice Principles, which govern privacy and data controls in order to successfully manage the privacy concerns about robots. One of those proposed additions to the FIPS was the principle of honest anthropomorphism. Toward that end, in our paper, we examine the trend of designing technologies, especially robots and artificial intelligence systems, that increasingly look, sound, and behave like human beings. Part of the essay involves explaining why this trend is occurring, noting what benefits it can bring, and more fundamentally, how it capitalizes on deeply rooted evolutionary tendencies in human perception and cognition. The majority of the essay involves clarifying the risks involved, risks that include significant privacy and security concerns, as well as dangers related to emotional manipulation, misplaced expectations, and even harms related to perpetuating unfair stereotypes. It could be gender, possibly race, age, but also other individual characteristics that are possibly not included in legally protected categories. Our goal is to help technologists, policymakers, and even the general public to make better decisions when this type of practice is involved, and hopefully to drive practices that would avoid some of these design choices, whether intentional or unintentional. What we've essentially done is created a taxonomy, which we offer as a way of clarifying the central problems that can arise when people treat machines as more human-like than they really are. By implication, this conceptual framework also suggests ways to avoid these complications and pitfalls. Boundary management is a human's perception of their immediate surroundings and their ability to analyze the risk and design an appropriate behavioral strategy in response to their situation. For privacy, this, would be, and this is understanding the threat of being overheard in public, or perhaps being aware of being on video surveillance. For example, people were initially, and many still are, very shocked to find smart TVs playing a listening, recording, or data sharing function that is not implicit in their initial understanding of how TVs work. Taking things at face value, when whatever the face value is might be changing, changing rapidly and changing in fundamental ways from a historical understanding or experience, poses an unfair risk to consumers. Of the various predictive strategies that humans might so select in their behavioral response, these have been discussed and defined by Daniel Dennett. One is the intentional stance, which treats the object that you're attempting to evaluate as a rational agent, which will act according to its own self-interests and motivations, which are tied to its own beliefs and feelings. 
We see examples of this in terms of an autonomous system when people talk about a game playing program, teaching itself to play the game and discovering, exploring, or implementing moves that a human would never make. There seems to be agreement among the people evaluating these strategies that human brains work in a predictable enough way that we can agree on strategies that appear in this context that would not, or at least have not, ever occurred via human development and choices. Sean Gallagher did work that relates to this discussion in his analysis of how humans respond to faces, something he calls direct perception. We don't see a person's face react, see their, their face react, and then have to stop and think or iter iteratively evaluate the various things we might be happening. We simply see them smile or a wrinkled brow or a blank stare and we intuitively understand happiness, confusion, or disinterest. As Gallagher points out, these exchanges have a momentum of their own, a feedback between the parties, and both agents are caught up in the back and forth engagement. As he points out, a social robot would have to exhibit these behaviors to a fairly sophisticated level to truly engage with humans, because what is not said in this exchange is at least as important as what is verbalized. We already anthropomorphize everything as humans, from rocks to Roombas to mechanical devices on the battlefield. Therefore, when robots approach or mimic human-seeming operations, the results can be extreme. The spectrum of an impact on a user can range from effective delivery of the service, something needed to accomplish the goal, to manipulation of people based on their known preferences and behaviors, or can ultimately result in exploitation of their vulnerabilities at the expense of their dignity, their autonomy, or even their physical safety. For example, a home care robot would need to provide a sense of reliability and safety for the client. But what of the robot's practices in terms of seeking compliant behavior and nudging or encouraging compliant um, responses? And at whose behest does it use those abilities? The clients, the insurance companies, the doctors, perhaps a relative with power of attorney? Finally, does the robot's design explicitly play on a patient's innate human responses to coerce desired behaviors with or without the client's awareness and engagement? The examples that I've pointed out here in the taxonomy provided, which I obviously will not go through in detail, um, are just a couple to make the point with a quick reference. Uh, on the first slide, we're talking about making a robot appear to have emotions. They might smile or frown or exhibit some other kind of body language, shrug, pull away, jump back in surprise, that mimic human engagement. This can create an unjustified sense of trust or in perhaps a sense of fear in the uh, client that they're interacting with. Similarly, adapting voice programs to carry emotional context or meaning, to sound calm or excited, to imply age and wisdom, or perhaps youth and vulnerability. If connected to the home systems, whether it's a Wi-Fi or an internal network, connected to other dedicated users or to the internet more broadly, the system can cause people to under or overestimate the capabilities of the robots and cause unjustified responses that can prove dangerous or just wrong. While some people have gone so far as to say that we should never design robots or AI systems to mimic humans, we have not gone that far, but we hope to contribute to the awareness and practices by designers and engineers, as well as the understanding and regulation by companies and legislators to protect consumers in these contexts from being disadvantaged by their own innate humanity. Thank you. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Brent Middlestadt. Um, I'm going to tell you about a bit of work that I did with uh, Chris Russell and Sandra Vochter. Um, and basically what the work is looking at is the current state of uh, the field of explainable AI or essentially research on explainability and interpretability in machine learning um, and looking at whether the direction that it's heading is going to get us to a place where we are satisfying the requirements or the demands um, of AI ethics initiatives, of policy initiatives where there are calls for increased transparency um, and accountability in machine learning and AI. Um, so this is a fundamentally interdisciplinary work. I'm a philosopher, uh, Chris is a computer scientist, Sandra is a 
lawyer, uh, to borrow a, a joke from earlier today, um, what happens if, sorry, what happens when a philosopher, a lawyer, and a computer scientist walk into a bar and start talking about what makes a explanation meaningful? Um, in my experience, the computer scientist and the lawyer start yelling at each other immediately, and the philosopher sits in the corner and contemplates the nature of their dispute. So what we, what we quickly realized um, was that we were talking about very different sorts of things when we were talking about explanations. And I think this is true of a lot of the discussion around transparency and explainability um, in general, in particular a disconnect between what the technical community is talking about and what sort of the legal policy ethical community is talking, talking about. And so what I'm reporting today is essentially the groundwork that the three of us did for a paper that we published last year on counterfactual explanations um, and the general data protection regulation that was very much looking at what sort of explanations could you provide um, within the context of, of the GDPR. Um, and just sort of a, a quick plug here is to say that that method that we created, the counterfactual explanations, has now been um, implemented in the what-if interface for TensorFlow so everybody can uh, sort of play around with, with counterfactual explanations and, and generate their own. But in terms of what makes a meaningful explanation or how should we explain decisions that are made by algorithms, there's a number of relevant considerations about sort of the type of explanation you're giving itself. So who is your audience? Um, when do people actually want explanations and why are they asking for them? Um, should I describe how a system uh, or model works in general or am I talking about how your particular case was decided? And which information should I provide to you? So should I provide things like source code, input data, features, the weightings or the rankings, maybe the proximity to a decision boundary, the relevance of the features, or the most relevant features for your particular decision? So there's a number of things I could potentially uh, provide you, and that's certainly not an exhaustive list. And the explanations them themselves could address a number of different types of questions that have to do with uh, system performance or system behavior? Um, are the decisions being made by the system sensible? Are they conforming to relevant legislation like anti-discrimination law? And as the, the user or as the, the subject of the decision, am I being, being treated fairly? What could I do di uh, differently next time to get a favorable outcome if I didn't get one? And of course, answering these sorts of questions uh, for machine learning is, is very difficult because we're talking about systems where the um, where the internal state is composed of mil potentially millions of interdependent values and of course it's very difficult to hold more than, I think the, the magic number is seven plus or minus two, it's, it's difficult to hold more than nine things in your mind when you're um, sort of understanding a, a phenomenon or an event. So of course explaining the entire decision making rationale or the decision making criteria when you're talking about millions of values is very difficult if not impossible. And so that raises the question of, well, what, what sort of explanations can we actually provide that would answer any of these sorts of questions? So within what I'll call XAI, or essentially interpretability and uh, explainability research, um, the, the sort of dominant approach at the moment is to create simplified approximations of more complex models. And there are two main types, and this is a, a very broad categorization. You have linear or gradient-based approximations, which will assign a single importance weight to each feature. Or you have decision tree-based methods where you're using nested sets of yes-no decisions to approximate the more complex classifier. And it's worth saying that these methods can be used for both global and local explanations. So we like to think, we, we thought that a useful analogy to draw would be between these sorts of approximations, these simplified uh, approximations, and scientific modeling. We think that they're actually very close to one another. Um, in the sense that scientific models aren't intended to capture the full behavior of a physical system, they just provide some coarse approximation of how it behaves. Um, they provide accurate descriptions of a phenomenon, but they may break down in larger or smaller domains. A good example of this would be Newtonian physics, which is simple enough to be taught to school children. It's uh, sort of good enough for most day-to-day -day engineering needs, but it breaks down when very uh, high precision is required when you're talking about very large or very small uh, scales where you'd need general relativity or quantum physics. Uh, so a good example of this would be GPS satellites that uh, are not accurate enough unless they account for uh, general relativity. And of course, scientific models, as with the approximations, um, can have, uh, it can be very useful for debugging or predicting model behavior over a restricted domain. And of course, they have lots of educational value as well. 
Now, of course, there are, as hinted to, there are a number of uh, limitations or challenges for scientific models. This is where we run into Box's maxim that all models are wrong, but some are useful. And the reason he says that is because essentially models will have a three-way trade-off between their accuracy, so how well they describe the, the more complex phenomenon you're trying to model, um, the size of the domain that they cover, and the uh, relative complexity of the, the approximation. And as with scientific models, what we really need to know about these approximations in XAI is um, when they are reliable, where they break down, and where their behavior is uncertain. Now, a very simple demonstration of, of uh, those characteristics in practice. Let's say that we wanted to pro provide a linear approximation of the blue line, the red line being the linear approximation. Where you set the domain or where you set the boundaries will drastically change what the approximation looks like. And essentially the effect of this is that the approximation can give you a very, very misleading picture of how the entire model uh, behaves. And so the problem that we're facing right now in the field is that we're creating these sorts of approximations, we're calling them explanations, even though they're not really explanations, and they're giving the sense that we understand how the model uh, behaves in general. And we're not doing enough to validate our approximations and to provide information about their limitations. So where they perform well, where they break down, and where we're just not certain. And so with those limitations in mind, I, I start to question whether we're actually going to get to the point where we're satisfying the legal and ethical demands for transparency and explainability um, if what we're doing is, is just providing these approximations. They can be very useful sort of do-it-yourself kits to create your own explanations and ask what-if questions, but they're not necessarily going to be useful for uh, users or for the people subjected to decisions. So another way to look at this uh, to see how we could get closer to those ideals would be to look at what we know about explanations from philosophy and cognitive science. And a very sort of simple a uh, distinction to draw here would be between full and partial explanations or scientific and everyday explanations. And it's just to say that the types of explanations we're talking about uh, within explainability would be everyday explanations that are focusing on why a particular fact, so an event, a property, property, a decision occurred, rather than some sort of general scientific relationship. Now, Tim Miller did a, wrote a very good paper uh, in 2017 that was essentially a review of articles and empirical studies um, from, from philosophy, from the cognitive sciences, from psychology. Um, and he came to the conclusion that uh, everyday explanations are contrastive, selective, and social. That basically people have a preference for those sorts of explanations. And so to just go through those three criteria very quickly. Explanations are contrastive in the sense that they're quite often sought in response to a counterfactual case, which means they're sought when something goes wrong is, or is perceived as abnormal, either because it was the outcome you're not expecting or because it's violated some sort of social or ethical norm. They're selective in the sense that you are not explaining the entire causal chain that led to an event, but rather you're selecting particular causes that are seen as relevant based on your, your needs or your prior knowledge or whatever, uh, whatever it may be, whatever the constraints are. And of course, there are multiple possible valid explanations of the event you want to explain. There are multiple valid causes to it. And so both of these, uh, both of these uh, criteria in practice, just very simple uh, demonstration of that. We have this classic example of why did a glass break? Well, maybe that the glass broke because gravity exists. It fell off the table and gravity caused it to fall. It could be because the surface it fell onto is harder than glass, so it shattered because of that. But I'm personally interested in who actually was responsible for breaking the glass, in which case the correct explanation for me is because my cat knocked it off the table. So it really depends on what your particular needs are as the person asking for an explanation. Okay, and then finally, explanations are social in the sense that they are not a one-way street. They require some sort of interaction between the explainer and the explainee. And I'll just leave you with these, the implications for fat. Uh, basically, we need to do more work to create uh, these sort of contrastive explanations that we can provide to end users. So I look forward to your questions and thank you very much. We're going to tag team this one. Uh, my name is Sebastian Bentall. I'm at NYU uh, in their law and engineering departments. Uh, this is, I'll take the liberty of introducing Professor Bruce D. Haynes of the Department of Sociology at UC Davis, who over the course of his career has uh, written extensively on the subject of race and racial formation. 
Uh, his most recent book is entitled The Soul of Judaism, Jews of African Descent in America. Our argument uh, starts from the extensive literature on fairness and machine learning, um, which often treats group categories as generic and abstract. Uh, this talk is specifically about racial categories, which are, in fact, anything but generic and abstract. Um, and uh, the core of our argument is that the categories themselves are unfair. And so uh, using explicit racial categories in a fair ML intervention uh, risks reifying those categories, which are, in fact, political constructs uh, that were designed to create social inequality. So uh, we would prefer that that didn't become you know, the industry standard, say. Uh, and we propose an alternative, uh, which is to design for social integration. So starting from the understanding that racial descriptions really reduce and distort more granular human features like phenotype, social class, and ancestral origin, uh, we propose using unsupervised machine learning to detect quasi-racial dimensions of segregation and then use those to inform fair ML methods as before. Um, really, this argument only makes sense in the context of uh, you know, deep sociological knowledge about race, to which I will defer to Bruce. Bruce, what is race? <laughs> uh, well, what is and what isn't race? Um, First, I'd like to say that my comments are kind of piggybacking off of the conversation that we had yesterday about race, which I think is really important. We only have 10 minutes, and so the discussion about talking about race is socially embedded is very important. And one of the things that came across when we first started writing this paper is that um, much of the literature sort of starts with the presumption that race is identity. And first, let me state first, race is not identity despite the fact that race has dimensions of identity. Um, so um, the second point I'd like to make is uh, certainly there are multiple causes to social phenomenon, which was certainly just made and point made in the last presentation. And um, so I want to start with beginning to sort of unpack what we mean by race in America. And so first we need to really understand race is a classification system. And it's a classification system imposed by states. And we can see that if we look across Latin American states and we can see the variability in the way the category of black is constructed, for example. And so first we need to think of race as an ascribed category, rather than thinking of race as an identity category. As an ascribed category, we then need to think about the ways in which um, meanings about racial categories change over time. They're not static. And so um, even if we look at the late 19th century US census, we have variability across decades about what racial categories are being deployed. And so the state creates the context by which so-called minority groups or groups defined within the state's classificatory system respond to the state's classificatory system. So that's the, the, the dynamic response that groups take on and produce cultures and identities themselves. But we need to understand that in terms of race, those cultures and identities are explicitly embedded within a colonial framework, which defines race categories as inherently unequal. So white and black as categories are not nominal categories, they're hierarchical status categories. And we need to understand them as representing inequality rather than almost uh, sometimes mythologically thinking that we could somehow statistically um, make black and white categories equal when in fact the very definition of them is that they are unequal. So um, I'm going to skip through this because in fact uh, we only have so much time. So I really want to point out, there, there are two pieces to the argument, I think, uh, based on the conversation yesterday that I think is most important. The first is that race is ascribed, and that the categories of race are imposed on, on subjects. The second, that ascription of the category 
leads to the organization of society around those categories. In other words, we discriminate based on those categories, we sort based on those categories, and it's through those mechanisms that we create racially based disparities. So there is both the historical formation of the category of race, the ascription of the category of race by the state, and then in 1970, we began to change and say, well, no, you can check the box now. What race are you? So suddenly, we treat it as an identity category. So this identity category is based on the back of an imposed category, an ascribed category that is fundamentally an unequal category. And so um, the challenge, it seems to me, for the data scientist people is to no longer treat race as identity, but to in fact disentangle social identity from the socially embeddedness of race, and understand, in other words, understand that race is a signifier of inequality. Race does not cause something. Processes cause race as an outcome. And so um, I'm gonna turn it over to my partner. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him. Um, and he has proposed, uh, this, uh, Seth is proposing uh, one possible solution to the, to the stickiness and socially embeddedness of race. Thanks, Bruce. Obviously, that's a really tall order. So this is, a, uh, this is just trying to, to do a proof of concept that something can be done. Um, and uh, in the context of this field of fair machine learning, uh, what we're proposing is that uh, basically a pre-processing step. Um, we know that race is ascribed to people on the basis of properties of them, such as phenotype and uh, socioeconomic class and events related to it and their ancestral origins. And if we use that data and do a dimensionality reduction technique on that, we can derive categories empirically uh, and feed those into the fair machine learning processes. And these would account for segregation. Um, but without reifying the category. So as an idea of just how that would work, um, imagine nine tracts of land, each with 25 people on it, and uh, say three binary features, red, green, and blue. It's obviously a toy example, but uh, how this would work is you would aggregate the features on each land tract, and then uh, take the first principal component of that, that's the, d the dimension of greatest variation among them, and that gives you uh, a vector which represents the, the, amount, the greatest segregation among them. So in this data, um, there's, there's bluer and redder uh, tracts of land, green is, is more or less irrelevant. And once you have that vector, you can transform the original population data by it uh, into the space defined by that vector. And if you would like, you can uh, put in a threshold. And now you have quasi-racial categories based on the empirical distribution of those features in space. And so the motivation is that we're treating segregation in society and space as a cause and effect of injustice, and therefore a good proxy of uh, historical uh, racial discrimination, et cetera. Uh, and this method can be extended to uh, social segregation as well as uh, spatial by looking at connected nodes as a so in a social graph as a neighborhood. Um, principal component analysis uh, produces several different uh, vectors of variation with weighted significance. So you could detect potentially several different sort of quasi-races, and uh, uh, including those that haven't yet been politically recognized. Um, which is a very interesting, I, f I think. And then uh, these QR vectors can be computed dynamically from changing demographic data. So they are not fixed in history. They would adapt um, with, uh, say, patterns of immigration um, or migration to cities, for example. Um, so in sum, the racial categories are unfair, and we can potentially use machine learning to develop new kinds of racial projects that address that. Uh, and obviously, there's tons of refinement on the technique and validation that needs to be done before anybody actually uses this. But hopefully, I've convinced you this is a good start. That's it. So thanks for hanging. Uh, my name is Bruce Gleemore. Uh, uh, this work is done in collaboration with a colleague, John Harrington.
John was to be here, but uh, the uh, whims of airline mechanics prevented. <clears throat> uh, this is uh, very sad. His contribution is much the most interesting uh, of our joint contributions, uh, but I'll do my best to channel uh, John. So um, our, uh, our uh, paper offers a set of arguments aimed to winnow the set of measures of uh, algorithmic bias which are normatively relevant. Uh, I'll begin with uh, some formalities and then we'll move uh, to, the, to the normative part. So um, I take it you guys are all familiar with this lovely classification of measures of bias into uh, three, three groups. Measures sensitive to failures of independence, separation, and sufficiency. Um, uh, just to remind you, uh, independence holds when uh, algorithmic score is independent of probabilistically independent of uh, bias, uh, sorry, of, uh, of uh, um, sensitive classes uh, or attributes. Um, separation holds when score and class are independent, conditional on the behavior to be predicted, and sufficiency uh, holds when behavior and class are independent of the uh, score. Um, uh, each of these can be normatively motivated uh, in various distinct ways. If uh, you care about the procedure by which output is generated, uh, or, uh, or uh, uh, by, sorry, by which score is generated, with the distribution of output across classes, um, you should care about independence and its failure. If you care about uh, the distribution of error conditional on behavior, you should care about separation. And if you care about the distribution of error conditional on score, you should care uh, about sufficiency. Um, uh, it turns out that under some standard assumptions, which I will name, the causal Markov and faithfulness assumptions, uh, but not describe. Um, uh, you can read off uh, which of these conditions hold and which fail by attending to the causal structure relating uh, the various variables. So the graph on the uh, right um, uh, has uh, a model variable or set of variables M which uh, influence behavior and determine score uh, and score then influences outcome. In the happy case here represented where class uh, is causally unconnected the model variables uh, in any way. All three conditions are satisfied, um, <clears throat> it, but it's easy to generate unhappy cases. Uh, simply let class cause model variables. That's clearly ethically fraught. Um, and when that happens, all three conditions will fail. Um, <clears throat> that's actually good news. It means the conditions are signaling something, um, uh, but um, unhappily, they don't signal just that case. They will fail when class uh, is an effect of model variables, and they will fail equally well when class and model variables share uh, an unmeasured common cause. Um, uh, 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 matters are worse, actually, for separation and sufficiency. Um, those two conditions will fail when class causes behavior, um, as in this graph, or shares an unmeasured common cause with the behavior to be predicted. Uh, so we think. Uh, uh, first off, there are some lessons to be learned here. Uh, independence, sufficiency, and separation are satisfied when class is not causally connected to model variables and unsatisfied when class causes or is caused by or shares a common cause with model variables. Um, <clears throat> uh, but uh, sufficiency and separation are unsatisfiable when, uh, when class shares a, com a common cause with behavior or directly causes behavior. And for that reason, measures of conditional error bias, uh, so measures sensitive to failures of su sufficiency and separation are bad tests of procedural and outcome bias. Um, uh, worse, we think uh, those causal connections be between class and behavior uh, are likely to be ubiquitous. Uh, and uh, that means that those measures will also be bad measures of any kind of bias at all. Uh, so, uh, so we think they're normatively suspect. Still, that leaves um, failures of, uh, of independence, uh, uh, which, um, uh, which failures are implicated in two kinds of bias, procedural bias and outcome bias. So let me treat each in turn, starting with, uh, uh, starting with procedural bias. So <clears throat> uh, when things go awry with the procedure, we have disparate treatment. Um, and uh, the complex of causal uh, relationships that may be indicated by a failure of, uh, a failure of uh, independence um, uh, invites a distinction between uh, formal and intentional disparate treatment. So formal disparate treatment just requires that class cause a model variable um, uh, <clears throat> and no more. Intentional uh, 
intentional uh, disparate treatment is more lenient. Any causal connection between class and model variable suffices, uh, but there's a further condition, namely, uh, namely uh, that uh, there be some intention to discriminate against one class or another. Um, importantly, you cannot read off from the failure of independence either the existence of formal or intentional uh, 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 disparate treatment. Both require a further showing either a finer showing of the causal connections in the case of formal disparate treatment or, or, uh, or um, a showing of intention. Uh, nonetheless, um, uh, both kinds of, both kinds of uh, disparate treatment are bad news, uh, and it's worth noting here that the values implicated are those uh, connected with equal citizenship. So um, uh, uh, violations involve disrespect or ill will or arbitrariness of some kind. All right, so uh, now to outcome bias. Uh, the first thing to say about outcome bias um, is that you, uh, uh, the fact that independence holds is not a reliable indicator of the fact uh, uh, that outcome bias has been avoided. Uh, in particular, if, uh, as in this graph, class directly causes outcome by some process unmediated by model variables, um, we will have outcome bias, and that outcome bias may be morally problematic for a variety of reasons. Uh, on the other hand, if independence fails, then we have good evidence to think, uh, we have good evidence to think uh, uh, that, that uh, um, we do have, we do have a disparate impact of, of some kind or another. And here, uh, the values in question may be those connected with equality of opportunity, a democratic equality if the outcome has to do with political status, uh, or um, most problematically with dessert. Um, there's actually a lot to say about dessert. The ethicists have some uh, work to do here. Uh, the, the, one, the, one, the one further feature that connects to structure is this. It's very hard to tell a story where dessert uh, relevant values are undercut by the causal structure unless class causes model variables. So that's a kind of essential condition um, uh, uh, for uh, undercutting those values. So I'm going to skip that slide uh, uh, because John's not here uh, and I'll, I'll be rather brief with this one again because John is not here. So I said earlier that separation and sufficiency are normatively, uh, sorry, epistemically suspect. They're also normatively suspect. Um, so uh, even if you could get them to be satisfied, you should be leery of, uh, of uh, doing so. Um, uh, but I'll say no more than that uh, and refer you to the paper if you care for the details. Um, uh, 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 this is a lovely uh, matrix that uh, John drew up. Um, it uh, shows nicely uh, why uh, independence, uh, where and when independent separation and sufficiency uh, fail. So um, uh, on the, on the <coughs> row side, we have various causal conditions. Um, independence, you can see, holds when uh, uh, class and score are causally isolated. Um, no matter what happens with the relationship between class and, uh, and behavior, uh, but that's not true for separation and sufficiency, which is why they're uh, not so good signals. So I mentioned um, in uh, passing these conditions, uh, which I didn't say anything more about, uh, but I should refer you to them. If you care about causal inference, um, uh, and we think you ought, uh, then uh, the right place to go is Judea Pearl's causality, uh, Spurdy's Gleemore, and China's causation prediction and search, or if you are among the less formally inclined, Richard China's lovely introduction to causal inferences. And I will stop there. Thank you. So as usual, questions, both sides. Uh, okay, you're over there first. Hi, I have a question for, for Brenda, for the first talk, first speaker. So um, you mentioned um, that an honest um, robot should communicate its capabilities in a way that the human can understand and not overestimate or underestimate the capabilities of this robot. But I, I, I have the impression that uh, we are very prone to overestimating the capabilities of artificial intelligence systems. There is the ELISA effect, and there are other ways in which we tend to overestimate the capabilities of these systems, which is one thing that I find problematic. And, and the other element, which is perhaps has to do with the relationship between um, developers and people who are customers of machine learning and artificial intelligence systems, is that somehow the customers want um, wants a system that 
looks reliable and hides its complexity. And they would prefer simpler interfaces where you give them like red or green instead of a number or a confidence interval or whatever. And they tend to gravitate towards vendors that offer them this apparent simplicity. And, and without uh, perhaps a regulation, they, that, that will dominate the space. And so I, I, I wonder how, how in this context, like really we can expect robots to communicate their capabilities in a, in a way that we can actually under, understand. And, uh, yeah, that's my question. Um, I think that's a great point, great question. Uh, I want to make clear that we are not saying that systems shouldn't be able to be complex and do many of the things that people legitimately want to provide as services or that people want to receive as services, only that it should be transparent what those capabilities are or easily understandable the correct scope of engagement that the user could expect. And so things like um, red and green lights or differentiating um, ways of interacting that cue the consumer to that, that interrupt that automatic response. So one of the examples that Margot Kaminsky gives in her original paper, which is very relatable, is the idea that if, if it's a humanoid-ish robot that has something that appears to be a face with eyes, and the eyes are closed or off or the light is off, that the robot is not actually still recording either from those optical sensors or from anywhere else on it because our human response is if the eyes are closed, it's not recording. And you know, same for hearing. Um, so those are some sort of easily understandable examples. So if the light is still on or if it is still recording, the light should be on or things that align with our expectations and make our assumptions valid in that, in that moment. Hi, um, I'm Ryan Kometi from Boston University. So also a question to the first uh, speaker. Um, first, thank you for, for the paper, for the talk. I think it's, it's a great uh, uh, paper and you know, it's really dangerous. We, should, you know, we might be as a society digging our grave this way without noticing it. Uh, but um, uh, my question was, uh, did you give thought, or I'm sure you did, but what, what are your uh, thoughts to how are we going to get there? I mean, is it something that you think it's something that we can expect the industry to be self-regulated, like in other cases, or do we need uh, laws or regulations? And if so, then which type of laws? I mean, is it like consumer protection laws? Is it like fraud? Is it like uh, 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 you know tort, or is it like national security, public safety laws? You know, what is it exactly that? that is there anything in the current body of law that could allow us to build on? I wish I could answer that question in 25 words and I'd walk out of here really, really rich. Um, I, I think the point is our goal in creating this taxonomy was to create a language and a conversation in which to even have this conversation and put it in front of a room full of computer scientists and engineers who can then tell us what parts of it are going to be hard and what parts of it may not even be possible or what the challenges are of doing this successfully and create that back and forth between the you know those of us who are sort of on the policy philosophy should be kind of side and those who are on the we have to make the product side and figure out how we get there if we share the value that we shouldn't be deceiving or exploiting people so i don't really have a you know, a hands-on answer to that other than this was our sort of first step, was to create a common language for it as a way to have that, com that conversation. Thank you. So we only have about two and a half more minutes, so I'll just keep it really brief. We're gonna try to take two more. Um, so try to keep it brief. Um, in drawing some comparisons between how people have been explaining <clears throat> climate catastrophe and that that is a system that has impacts, you know, at a level of these individual animals. Now we're able to anthropomorphize animals in kind of expanding on what's happening at the climate level. So kind of in comparing and contrasting this ecological crisis and explaining that larger system to explaining these systems that determine algorithmic accountability or, or AI outcomes, uh, do you kind of see anthropomorphization and its relation to agency as kind of poisoning the well of discussion given that though we're able to anthropomorphize animals in these ecological terms as they don't have agency, we can't really describe an AI outcome as relying on agency. Kind of to clarify what I'm getting at here is when we talk about a self-driving a self car deciding not to hit someone, we're assigning agency in trying to make something more explainable. So would we be abandoning agency as a discussion or abandoning anthropomorphization entirely? Uh, and kind of what are your thoughts on that? 
think I only realized about halfway through that that question was going to be for me. Um, I kind of bridges between the both. I, I'm really. <laughs> I, I'm really not sure I can answer that, especially in the very limited time, but I'd be happy to chat with you right afterwards Thank and you. have a conversation. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I'm William Isaac. I'm from DeepMind. Uh, this question is for Sebastian and Dave. Uh, thank you for your paper. I think it's actually a much needed kind of nuance to this discussion about race. Uh, but my question is about using PCA for kind of this implementation of trying to disentangle these different features. Uh, typically, PCA doesn't have an intuitive kind of breakdown between the different dimensions and matching them onto the actual theories that you might want to ascribe. So I, I might see there might be an additional kind of interpretation challenge with trying to like identify one feature. So let's say if you're concerned about socioeconomic disparities, right, and mapping that onto the correct dimension. So then you can do kind of the work that you want to do afterwards. And my second kind of question and it's like concern is that it also kind of presents the opportunity for gaming. So now if you have like seven different dimensions of race, right, what if I'm a developer and I want to find the one that minimizes differences between groups? So I can say, well, I picked one dimension of race that is like looks like it's applicable, but it actually might not be the one that we actually care about. So how do you get around that, get that potential for gaming when you're using race in that way? I, uh, I think I, I, I simply have to agree with you on your first point. Yeah. And on your second point, yeah. um, I, I guess I've got to ask for a clarification. I get, if you start with, the presumptions are starting with yeah. good sort of demographic data yeah. Uh, yeah. distributed in some way, you yeah. know, collected by something like a census, or right? at which point, um, I, I'm not clear what, what gaming would so, be. So in this scenario, let's say you have two dimensions, right, on, uh, like on your principal components analysis. Let's say like there's one dimension with a great deal of variation and you use it and it's like there's a lot of variation between these groups and it might be biased, but there's another one where you might not have as much variation between the groups. What stops me from using the one that doesn't have as much variation? And then it's like the post-processing doesn't really, you know, you don't have to do very much, right? Got it. it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, what, what we need to do yeah. uh, as work is figuring out how to get those uh, several different vectors with their respective uh, eigenvalues into a something which like grades down into a sort of fairness modification algorithm. We didn't do any of that work because it, we didn't have time even yeah. to explain PCA. Yeah. Yeah. But thanks for the <laughs> yeah. question. No, but it's good paper. Thank you. Uh, so please join me in thanking all our uh, panelists.